So for I say that if you look at any of the studies, patients report that the greatest stressors that they have encountered in the intensive care unit is pain, sleep deprivation, and the presence of tubes and mouth in uh, you know tubes in the nose and the mouth. So this is the thing that gives maximum discomfort to uh, people in the intensive care unit, and it's well known. So our job is not only to treat uh, critical illness, but we have to make sure uh, patients are comfortable. And in addition to this, a lot of the drugs that we give to provide sedation and analgesia also provide produces. And this is an entity we have to be very aware about. And this is um, you know the current buzz topic in uh, intensive care when you talk about sedation uh, and analgesia. Right. So if you look at the goals of sedation, now um, there are a lot of causative agents um, that cause an pain and delirium in the intensive care unit. So, uh, you know, even just lying, if I rest, all this can also produce, uh, you know, body pain. And a lot of interventions that we do in our uh, uh, intensive care unit, even things like uh, suctioning, physiotherapy, all this produces some amount of anxiety, pain, and also delirium. So we give various pharmacological as well as, uh, you know, non-pharmacological interventions are carried. And what we want our patient really to be is, you know, our patient in the intensive care unit can be anywhere between dangerous agitation to unresponsiveness. And what our goal is really to keep the patient calm, alert, and free of pain. So in this entire spectrum of distress, discomfort, and sedation, this is where our patient want to be. And if you want to, if you uh, keep this goal in mind, then it's very easy as we go along uh, with uh, understanding the practice of sedation and analgesia. So uh, when you look at sedation and analgesia, they kind of go hand in hand. And there are many tools in armamentarium. So sedation, you have a component of amnesia, hypnosis, anxiolysis, and you also have to produce uh, analgesia. And by and large, the mainstay of this therapy has been benzodiazepines. And uh, we also have used propofol. In terms of analgesics, we've largely used uh, opioids. And now we have the dexmedetomidine, which produces uh, weak sedation and also some amount of um, uh, analgesia. So largely, this is what we have in armamentarium. And if we look at the commonly used drugs for ICU sedation, and these are midazolam, propofol, opioids, and dexmedetomidine. So if you have, these are the minuses for these patients in terms of respiratory as you see, dexmedetomidine does not produce respiratory depression uh, regarding onset of action, amnesia. So in that sense, dexmedetomidine is not uh, a good amnesia. It doesn't produce amnesia. So that's one of the downsides. But if you look at the other things like rapid onset, easy arousability, amnesia, cardiostability, and the analgesia, dexmedetomidine uh, fares pretty well among the other drugs. I'm not going to make this whole talk about pharmacology of all these medications because you are aware, aware of this and you, uh, you don't need a talk on this. What I'm going to tell you is about various strategies. What are the current principles of management and what are the current guidelines? So let's go on to the strategies for sedation in the intensive care unit. And I really like the way this has evolved because it's, it's really like a story. You know, I'll, I'll start by telling you this first paper that came in the Lancet from John Cress. You know, John Cress is like the father of sedation for me. And this was published not in Lancet, sorry, in NAGM. And this was the first randomized controlled trial, just 128 patients, single center study. And what they did is in one group, uh, sedative infusions were interrupted. So what we call the daily interruption of sedation. And the control group, the infusions were not interrupted and they were given continuous sedation. And what did they find? They found that in patients who receive mechanical ventilation, daily interruption of sedation decreases the duration of mechanical ventilation and also the length of ICU stay. Although this was a small, small study, this was a landmark paper, a practice changing paper, because we actually started uh, performing daily interruption of sedation. Now remember that daily interruption of sedation is not performed to assess the neurological status of the patient as most people feel. It is basically to facilitate the metabolism of the drugs, right? Because when you give them as continuous infusion, especially in critically ill patients who have altered renal and hepatic function, these drugs do not uh, you know, act like those of you anesthesiologists uh, you know, in the operating room, their pharmacotherapy, you know, the kinetics and dynamics are altered. So uh, when you give prolonged infusions, they take even longer time. So the daily interruption is basically to facilitate metabolism of these uh, drugs and give the patient a kind of uh, sedation interval. And this small study actually 
improved outcomes, following which I'm sure most of you practice daily introduction of sedation. And we try to do this in the morning uh, because there are more staff around and more people who can be vigilant. And following this, they had another trial. And this was a multi-center trial involving uh, four uh, uh, centers. And what they did is they looked at the efficacy. This is very popularly known as the ABC trial. They looked at the efficacy and safety of paired sedation and of protocol for mechanically ventilated patients. So they said, okay, let us, you know, and this was four centers, 336 mechanically ventilated patients. So they said, we'll do a spontaneous awakening trial. But in addition to this, we'll also do spontaneous breathing trial. So this was the intervention group. And the other group was, of course, continuous sedation. So this was a wake up and breathe protocol or the ABC study. So these are landmark papers in sedation you should know to understand how our practices have evolved. So patient who is mechanically ventilated, they would give, of course, if it was accepted to give them a daily, uh, you know, awakening SAT, what we call DVD awakening trial. And this is, of course, if they didn't have any of these uh, contraindications, the patient is unstable, of course, you can't uh, wake him up. And uh, then if this they pass this, if they fail this, they would go back into full mechanical ventilation. If they pass the spontaneous, uh, you know, uh, awakening trial, then what was done was spontaneous breathing trial. That means putting them on, uh, say, pressure support. And if they fail this, of course, they would go back into full mechanical ventilation. And if they pass this, then some patients would even be considered for extubation. So this was called up the wake up and breathe trial or the ABC uh, protocol. And very, very interesting. If you look at the main outcomes of this study, they found that the ventilator free days, okay, and even the time to discharge from the intensive care unit, including the hospital, the 28 day mortality and the one year mortality, you can find that this was much better in the group that received this uh, the intervention. So the wake up and breathe protocol resulted in better outcomes in patients who are mechanically ventilated than the ICU and the standard approaches. And this should become the routine practice. And this the message from this uh, study. So not only did we start waking up patients, but we also started giving them spontaneous uh, breathing trials at the same time. Now, uh, people were very concerned about this study because they said, okay, you're waking up these patients, maybe the outcomes are better, but maybe if you're waking up these patients and putting them on spontaneous breathing like this, there may be long-term cognitive dysfunction. So a priori in this study, they had decided to follow up these patients long-term. So a subgroup of these patients got followed up with cognitive and psychological uh, you know, dysfunction outcomes in uh, this study. And they assessed this cognitive and psychological function. And they found that in this trial, the management of mechanically ventilated patients in ICU uh, with the wake up and breathe on resulted in similar cognitive and psychological and functional outcomes among both the groups. So this was very interesting. This didn't result in any psychological and cognitive. So what we started doing is we not only started waking up the patients, but we started giving them a spontaneous breathing trial if they passed this. And the next step was early physical therapy and occupational therapy. And this was another landmark paper that was published in Lancet. And this was a randomized controlled trial where not only did they wake up and give a, a spontaneous breathing trial, they also started early exercise and mobilization, you know, so physical and occupational therapy during the periods of interruption and uh, during the periods when the patient was spontaneously breathing, even passive physiotherapy was done. And this is very, very interesting because they found this was very safe. It was well tolerated and it resulted in better functional outcomes at hospital discharge, shorter duration of delirium and more ventilator free days. So not only were we waking up patients, we were keeping them, you know, trying a spontaneous awakening trial, spontaneous breathing trial and early physical therapy or passive uh, mobilization. So this became very popular and there's subsequently various papers on this, uh, you know, about early exercise in critically ill patients and how it enhances the uh, functional recovery in these uh, patients. So you can see, uh, you know, passive physiotherapy is being given to these patients uh, when they're on uh, pressure support ventilation. And then we move towards an era of lesser sedation in the ICU. So we were using, you know, earlier people were very deeply sedated uh, in the intensive care unit. And uh, we used to paralyze them and sedate them. I remember when I was a resident. And now we're moving towards lesser and lesser sedation. And this was a feasibility study that was done in uh, Professor JLV's unit. And they looked at uh, observation study uh, where they looked at 335 patients uh, in various intensive care units. And what they found is that there was only uh, you know, self-extubation in six patients and only one needed reintubation. And minimal use of sedation was feasible without apparent uh, adverse effects. So we are today moving towards less 
sedation in these patients. So it was it was feasible. Only forty two percent of this actually got uh, a sedation in the intensive care unit. So um, you know this whole concept of uh, daily awakening the patient and then uh, you know uh, spontaneous breathing and passive physiotherapy using less and less sedation actually became very very uh, popular and over the last uh, 20 years we have been following these uh, practices of trying to get the patients awakened weaning them off faster and doing these therapies to reduce um, improve the outcomes but however you know there were uh, several studies that looked at daily interruption of sedation in critically ill patients and there were five randomized controlled trials that were seen. And this was in uh, 10 years after John Crest did his study with daily interruption of sedation. And what they found in this meta-analysis was that daily interruption of sedation was not associated with a significant reduction in mechanical ventilation, length of hospital stay. And it was actually uh, associated with reduced risk of re requiring tracheostomy, of course. And they said that the current evidence suggests that daily interruption of sedation appears to be safe but the significant heterogeneity suggests that large RCTs with long-term survival are needed before daily interruption sedation can be recommended. So this is 10 years after John Cress's paper, and they found that perhaps there was no benefit of this daily interruption of sedation that we had been practicing for so many years in the intensive care unit. And then came this very famous randomized controlled trial from the group of Sangeeta Mehta, which was published in JAMA. They did a very nice RCT combined uh, countries in North America as well as Canada. And they said they wanted to test, uh, you know, 10 years after uh, uh, John Cress's paper where the daily interruption of sedation actually helps. So they use protocolized sedation and daily sedation interruption. These are the two stat strategies to minimize sedation. So it was a randomized controlled trial, 430 critically ill patients, 60 in surgical centers, Canada and the United States, as I mentioned. So in one, they gave the continuous opioid or benzodiazepine infusion and random allocation. So either you got protocolized sedation or you got protocolized sedation and you got daily interruption of uh, sedation. And what was very interesting is when they looked at the primary outcome in this study, they found that if you looked at any of the endpoints, there was no difference whether you use daily interruption of sedation or whether you use, um, you know, uh, did not interrupt the uh, sedation. And the conclusion of this randomized control trial is for mechanically ventilated patients managed with protocolized sedation, the addition of daily sedation interruption did not reduce the duration of mechanical ventilation. Now, a lot of people who are practicing daily interruption, including several ICUs in, in, in India, actually stopped this practice. But this was not the message really from the paper, because if you have protocolized sedation, that means if your patient is maintained at the sedation target, so they're already at lighter levels of sedation, then doing daily interruption of sedation is not going to work. But in our setting, if you see most of the time, I don't know, at least in my intensive care unit, a lot of the time the patients are in deep sedation. Now in these patients are probably the kind of patients that John Cress was looking at, and perhaps there is a benefit of using. So it really depends on the context that you're looking at. If you've achieved protocolized sedation, your patient is at very uh, you know lighter levels of sedation as is recommended, then probably daily interruption doesn't really benefit. And if you have patients that by and large quite deeply sedated, then nursing issues, then definitely daily interruption of sedation will make a difference. Now, you can't talk about sedation today without talking about delirium. Now, what is delirium? Delirium is an acute reversible disorder of attention and cognition. And this occurs in 60 to 80% of patients undergoing mechanical ventilation. And, you know, Fault, you know, predictive of threefold higher reintubation rates, more days on the ventilator, and also increased mortality rate. So you can't talk today about sedation and analgesia without talking about, in, in, uh, you know, delirium. And delirium is very high. You know, if you offhand ask somebody, what is the incidence of delirium in your ICU? They'll say 5%, 10%. It's really very high. And this is because delirium is invisible unless you look for it. And when you talk about delirium, the patient could be in any one of these states. He could be absolutely unarousable, that's like comatose, or he could be arousable to voice and could be in any of these states. It could just be mental status changes, fluctuating mental status, inattention. So he could be in any of these phases, and this patient could, uh, you know, to collectively be called as a patient in delirium. Now, why is it that people think that delirium is not much in the intensive care unit? And this is very important because delirium is invisible unless you look for it. So if you look at the delirium, vast majority of the delirium is hypoactive. That is the quiet kind of group. 
it is only 1% that is a pure hyperactive subtype. So, you know, when you look at a patient who's rowdy, agitated, pulling the tube, you say, yes, he's got delirium. This patient is delirious, right? But the guy who's just sitting like that, vacantly staring at you, you don't call him delirium. So unless you do an assessment or a scoring for delirium, you will not know what is the incidence of delirium in your intensive care unit. So very, very important today to look for delirium because it's invisible unless you look for it. And uh, yeah, because a hypoactive delirium is, uh, mixed delirium is most of the uh, cases of delirium. Now there are various risk factors for uh, delirium. Now there are various host factors, okay? Like your age, alcoholism, dementia, depression. These are the various things. These are host factors that are associated with a high risk of delirium. So these are the at-risk groups that you should be a little careful about. Uh, you know, patients with history of smoking, hearing impairment. Now, acute illness produces delirium in a lot of patients. So, you know, just your fever, sepsis, acidosis, even metabolic disturbances can produce delirium. And there are some iatrogenic things like not mobilizing the patients, our medications. Now, this is very important. Opioids, benzodiazepines, anticholinergic drugs, and even sleep disturbance. So these are definitely something that we can address uh, at least the acute illness and the iatrogenic and environment factors are definitely modifiable. And this is what we should aim at doing when we are talking about uh, delirium. And remember, there's a big role of sedatives. Okay. And uh, the GABA agonists are prone to cause acute cognitive dysfunction. So the benzodiazepines, even propofol and lorazepam has found to be an independent risk factor for transitioning into delirium. You know, when I was a resident, uh, we used to use a lot of lorazepam because it was a longer acting drug. Uh, so instead of midazolam, we used to use lorazepam, but uh, it has, was shown to be independently associated with delirium. And sedatives with agents like dexmedetomidine, which are the alpha-2 agonists, they cause less delirium than midazolam and propofol and uh, <laughs> use in the intensive care unit. If you look at benzodiazepines, so benzodiazepines are a big no-no if you look at delirium. And here you can look at the probability of developing delirium. And here on the uh, x-axis, you can look at the mean daytime uh, benzodiazepine dose. So, you know, the, as your dose is increasing, there's a proportionately increase in the uh, rise. And this is milligram per hour of, um, this was lorazepam that was used. And you can see the increase in the delirium. So earlier we used to use a lot of dex uh, benzodiazepines, midazolam infusions. You know, you know, we completely stopped this practice. If at all we need to use it in a patient who is not getting sedated, or you know, we need to sedate him very urgently, then we would just give a bolus of benzodiazepines. This practice of giving midazolam has completely stopped. In our and if you look at dex medicines, alpha two agonists, as you see that um, and this is a meta-analysis uh, sorry there's some disturbance coming yeah so if this is a false plot that you can see it's a meta-analysis of studies uh, and this is looked at four big randomized sequence trials that compared dexmedetomidine midazolam or propofol and uh, with lorazepam and midazolam and if you can look at uh, uh tapesh is a lot of disturbance i'm sorry Yes, sir. I'm just checking that. Yeah, yeah. Somebody's somebody clicking on screen. Okay. Please so, mute yourself, everybody. Uh, there is some disturbance. Yeah. Thank you. Somebody's. Uh, okay. So, uh, if you can see, if you can see, was, uh, the experimental arm. So uh, you can see that, um, you know, definitely compared to dexmedetomidine versus the other drugs, there was definitely less that was used with dexmedetomidine compared to other agents. So just moving on to uh, more about this, and this is just looking at dexmedetomidine-based sedation, and this is in surgical patients, and this was a meta-analysis of all the randomized control uh, trials. And here you can see uh, this is DEX versus the placebo. And if you look at DEX meritomidine, less delirium, less hospital stay uh, seen with the use of DEX meritomidine. And uh, the use of DEX was associated with lesser reduced delirium uh, and length of stay and also ICU and hospital stay in critically ill patients. And these were all, uh, of course, post-surgical patients. So there is a potential relationship between your sedation, delirium, and cognitive impairment. So this is very important. You know, you have critical illness, you give sedation to these patients. The critical illness itself could produce delirium, okay? Your sedation could further produce delirium or it may not produce delirium and no cognitive impairment. On the other hand, uh, you may get because of delirium and the critical 
to the brain long term cognitive impairment. so this is all interrelated you know, sedation the delirium and the cognitive impairment so this is something that we need to keep into mind when we talk about sedation delirium and cognitive dysfunction and what this paper uh, which was this was published in critical care clinics has found that critically ill patients who are heavily sedated especially with benzodiazepines they are at a high risk for delirium duration of delirium is very important and is potentially modifiable predictor of long term cognitive impairment so by avoiding delirium in icu you can actually avoid long term cognitive impairment and you should view delirium in sedated patients as a warning sign that this patient may be in, uh, you know you have to think about the brain injury and they should reduce and eliminate the sedation if possible so don't take this lightly you know people just don't take sedation very seriously but if you see delirium this means there is brain injury and you should be very careful about this long term cognitive effects in icu survivors and this was a very uh, this paper showed that these are all the series that have shown the prevalence of long term cognitive impairment in, and these were the survivors of critical illness and uh, you can see that the prevalence is pretty high in those who experience delirium so this is something really we cannot take lightly because the incidence of delirium is high and there are many various modifiable factors and we really need to look into them uh, when we're talking about uh, delirium now i'll come a little about the assessment of pain sedation and delirium this is very important now i'll start with pain because pain is very important because you cannot assess pain in a sedated patient very difficult to assess pain in the intensive care unit uh because many very often the patient should will be sedated so always ask a patient about their pain before sedating them this is extremely important and uh, we have certain tools uh, that are used for pain assessment you cannot use the same conventional tools that we use in anesthesia and uh, you know for post operative pain in awake conscious patients so the critical care uh, pain observational tool is what is recommended by the paris guidelines for the assessment of pain in the intensive care unit if you're not doing this that means you're not assessing pain in your intensive care unit what about sedation and delirium like i said sedation and delirium go hand in hand you can't just assess one and not assess the other so if you have to assess the level of sedation you use the ras that is the richmond agitation sedation scale or the sas scale and then you should assess delirium using the cam icu okay that is the confusion assessment method icu or the icds intensive care delirium screening uh, tool so these this is what you, these are the tools and i would say you should use a combination of cpot ras and cam icu this is what we are using in our intensive care unit because these are very easy uh, to assess so not just you, people are not looking they are looking at sedation to some extent uh, but not objectively assessing it and uh, delirium very very few people look at delirium and i've already told you how important it is to look at delirium in the intensive care unit so let's just come to pain that is a cpot that is the uh, critical care pain observation tool now this is very important because as you know patients in icu may be sedated so if they are awake of course you can ask them on a 0 to 10 scale and you can look at the visual analog scale and you can ask them to report their pain but if they are uh, partially sedated or not very con very levels of consciousness then it may not be possible and the cpot is very useful because it takes into account other factors uh, where verbal communication is not possible like facial expression body movement even the muscle tension it looked at okay so there are different points that are available to do okay and this is uh, five different criteria that we can uh, look at you know four criteria and uh, based on this there are various uh, points that are given right from you know, up to a score of 10 and depending for example if you look at uh, say a uh, body movements okay so they if they absent or uh, you know there's protection or if they restless so depending upon that you can give uh, this kind of uh, score to the patient facial expression so based on this you have a score and you should try to keep your critical care pain observation tool you know should be closer to 2 uh, then it should it will be in uh, you know uh, then this patient is uh, not having and if you see a higher cpot score then you should give analgesia to this uh, patient so sedating is not the option because the patient may be tachycardic and you might be you know just knocking him off with some lamp but what you actually need to give is opioid to this patient and then what's very important is the ras score and this is the uh, uh, richmond agitation and sedation scale now this is really really um, very important now this is uh, you know uh, more important than just using the uh, usual uh, sedation scores that we used to use uh, previously because it also uh, you know takes into account the delirium component so the richmond agitation scale 
uh, or the SAS, that is the sedation agitation scale, is very important to look at. Now, this is like really easy because you have a patient on plus four or you have minus three, and zero is where you want him to be, that is alert and calm. And plus four is a patient who's very combative, agitated. So, you know, as you're coming down, the scores go down. Zero is what you want to achieve. And as he's, uh, you know, going more deeper, like drowsy, light sedation, moderate sedation, it goes into minus. And then he goes in the red zone if it's deep sedation or unarousable. Okay, so that becomes minus four, minus five. If a patient is at minus four, minus five, straight away, you should stop the sedation. So when you're doing a Richmond agitation sedation scale, first it is to voice. So all these criteria is to voice, right? So you should, you know, you assess this by looking at voice. And uh, of course, if he's a deeper level of sedation, he's not going to respond to your voice, then you need to touch the patient. And as I mentioned that if it's minus four, minus five, you should stop sedation uh, in these patients, okay? So if the RAS is three or more, then you should produce to do, you know, proceed to doing the CAM ICU, that is a confusion assessment uh, method to assess for delirium. So before you assess for delirium, you need to do the RAS to look at the uh, sedation level and document the sedation level. And now the CAM ICU is very, very interesting. Please, I urge all of you, you should do this in your intensive care unit and you'll be surprised how many people are actually delirium, have delirium and how many have hypoactive delirium in your intensive care unit. Now, if you want to do the CAM ICU, and this is how you can do it. And this comes from Professor Veseli in Vanderbilt. And we worked along with it. We have translated this into Hindi. Into, we validated this scoring system into Hindi, into Marathi. It was already done in Malayalam by somebody. And we are also trying to do it in other uh, languages. But Professor Eli is very happy if anybody would like to do this for research purposes and validate it in any of the local languages. So if you look at the CAM ICU flow sheet, first thing you should look at for any acute change or fluctuation in mental status. If it's no, then the patient has no delirium, okay? In the last 24 hours, of course. And if it is yes, then you have to assess for inattention, okay? So you ask him to squeeze your hand. And you say, whenever I say A, squeeze my hand. When I say any other alphabet, you know, uh, don't squeeze my hand, okay? Now, it looks very simple, but I will show you in a very nice video. It's not so simple, you know? A person who looks absolutely fine to you, normal, communicating with you, might actually have delirium. So you say something like save heart. So you say S and he should not squeeze your hand. You say A and he squeezes your hand. And then he says, so you just your fingers like this, okay? So if he makes two errors, zero to two errors, then this is negative for delirium. But if he makes more than two mistakes, then, and he's got altered level of consciousness, that is your RAS is more than zero, straight away he's delirium positive. If your RAS is zero, then you need to look for disorganized thinking. And you ask him four questions. What are the four questions you could ask? Will a stone float on water? Are there fish in the sea? Does one pound weigh more than two pounds? You could say one kilogram. Can you use a hammer to pound a nail? Okay, so this is what the four questions you could ask for disorganized thinking. If there's more than one error, straight away this patient has delirium. And if it is, uh, you know, just up to one error, then he's negative for delirium. It's really simple to do at a bedside. And I'm going to show you a very nice uh, video. And this is Pawan, my uh, uh, fellow, critical care fellow, who's now in the UK. And very long back when we were training our nurses to do uh, CAM ICU, how to do CAM ICU, I had uh, recorded this while he was doing at the bedside. So I'd just like you to watch this. This is Mr. D'Souza, a 35-year-old male, a case of ALL, who has been ventilated for the past seven days for pneumonia. For the past 24 hours, he's been off ventilator and hemodynamically stable. We will now assess his... Uh, presence of delirium in this patient. For the uh, uh, he appears calm, so his Richmond agitation sedation score appears to be zero. So uh, once his uh, RAS score is zero, we will assess whether he has any acute change or fluctuating course in his mental status, which he does. So the next is to assess his inattention. Mr. D'Souza. I am Dr. Pawan, your ICU doctor. I will be perform performing a surgery. Can you please hold up your hand? I will ask you a few questions. You have to squeeze my hand whenever you hear the alphabet A. S, A, A, B, E, A, H, A, R, P. 
so the patient has made more than two errors so uh, we have to assess his altered level of consciousness according to the ras score he is alert and calm so his score is zero so next we assess disorganized thinking mr disuza i will be asking you a few questions right now i want you to think about them and answer does a stone float on water are there fish in the sea is 1 pound heavier than 2 pounds can you use a hammer to pound a nail if the patient does no or one errors then he does not have delirium if the patient does more than one error then delirium is present this patient has committed more than two errors so he has delirium right so that was my uh, fellow showing you this demonstration so uh, what i wanted to say is it's something really simple to do at the bedside and i urge you to do it because if you're not assessing delirium as i said delirium is invisible unless you look for it unless you assess delirium you will not know what is the incidence of delirium in your uh, icu and does it matter it does it not only makes a difference to increase length of stay what uh, you know worsens uh, increase morbidity for the patient but also long term cognitive effects and now you have studies showing increased mortality in those patients who extreme experience delirium so very important to know the incidence of delirium and use measures by which you can uh, control the uh, incidence of uh, delirium so i'll just move on to the next slide and uh, then i'll come to the padis guidelines and this is the pain agitation delirium uh, in the intensive care uh, 2018 guidelines and this is a very important guidelines is updated after the 5 years after the 2013 padis guidelines so it gives specific recommendations and this is the reference it was published in critical care medicine in uh, september 2018 and i'm just going to give you a snapshot of this but i urge all of you i mean this is all you know need to know about and this is of course for adult patients these are the practice guidelines for prevention management of pain agitation sedation and delirium and immobility and sleep because all this goes hand in hand in adult patients in the intensive care unit so very important guidelines for exam going and students you need you should know about the padis uh, guidelines so i'll just give you a snapshot now when it comes to pain okay you use assessment driven protocol based step wise approach to pain so always assess pain before you look for sedation always give analgesia before you give sedation otherwise you won't be able to assess the pain appropriately and uh, that's uh, what i said and you should use acetaminophen as an adjunct to opioids and this is to decrease the pain intensity and also the opioid consumption so try to use paracetamol unless contraindicated in critically ill uh, patients and you can use not only pharmacological with various non pharmacological therapies i don't know how much they're feasible in your uh, intensive care unit but you should try to work towards this with your physiotherapist your occupational therapist massage therapy music therapy relaxation therapy and all this can be used for pain management and uh, a good thing to do is involve the family in all these activities because of course we are very burdened with a lot of work but remember pain is not only just about pharmacology but non pharmacological treatment also is very important as an adjunct and is recommended regarding and sedation today we use lighter level of sedation okay of course in some patients it may not be feasible and you may need to give deep sedation in critically ill mechanically ventilated patients and what do we use we should be using propofol or we should be using dexmedetomidine over benzodiazepine for sedation in critically ill mechanically ventilated patients now um propofol of course because of propofol infusion syndrome we cannot use it for more than 2 to 3 day you know 48 hours uh dexmedetomidine gives lighter levels of sedation so a combination of dexmedetomidine and opioid uh, can be used for uh, sedation and the beauty about dexmedetomidine is it produces some amount of sedation but also it reduces your opioid requirement by 50% so you can actually reduce your fentanyl or opioid morphine into your infusion uh, in these patients if you're adding uh, dexmedetomidine and it gives you the added advantage of reducing delirium now opioids have been a little controversial opioids are the mainstay of your pain uh, so uh, people you know opioids also are associated with delirium however in a inadequate pain management also produces delirium so it's really a balance between the two 
If you don't give adequate analgesia with opioids, there can be delirium. And opioids also produce some amount of delirium, which is much less. So usually the mainstay of treatment should be opioids, especially in post-surgical patients. But it is not that medical patients don't need analgesics. And opioids are not just for pain. Okay, so it, it uh, you know, your cough reflex, your antitussive, uh, this thing, all this is taken care of by the opioids. So you do need uh, opioids, but you can reduce their requirement by adding dexmedetromidine uh, infusion for uh, uh, pain. And then coming to uh, delirium, it's not a single component. So you can use things like bright light therapy. And this, these things are very uh, important in delirium management. You know, you can't just keep the patient in a dark corner in the intensive care unit. You need to provide a clock. You need to provide him glasses, a newspaper, physical. At least, you know, get him conscious about day and night and various uh, therapy. So it should be a multi-component approach. You re reduce the modifiable risk factors for delirium, improve the cognition, and optimize sleep. So a lot of measures are happening today to optimize sleep in the intensive care unit. Uh, you know, including mobility and hearing and vision. So uh, this is, uh, of course, a low quality of uh, evidence, but it's it's really, really uh, important. Don't pay any attention uh, to this. You know, the ICUs are very, very noisy. And at night, you will see the lights are on. So you can put dim lights. You can avoid the non-essential. You don't have to give all the medications, uh, you know, by the, of course, if they're important medications that need to go at a particular time, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., you can understand, but you don't need to do that. The sponging begins very early in the morning, and all this produces a lot of distress and can actually, you know, disturb the sleep-wake cycles of these patients. And this is a, a very important factor that contributes towards delirium. So we should try to make our um, ICUs more friendly to optimize sleep and mobility also of the patient uh, is very important to prevent uh, delirium. In terms of uh, pharmacological therapies, uh, you know, do not routinely use haloperidol and atypical antipsychotics, uh, you know, or HMGA coa receptors like your statins to treat delirium. And, uh, you know, this a lot of quetiapine, a lot of haloperidol is used. If you have dangerously agitated patients, of course, you can use this, but this is not the way forward uh, to treat. So in patients who experience significant distress, secondary to anxiety, fearfulness, hallucinations, or delusions, or who are very agitated and maybe physically harmful, and these may benefit from a short-term use of haloperidol or these antipsychotic agents until these distressing symptoms resolve. But remember, you should look at other medical causes. Okay, maybe it's just a worsening of the infection. Maybe it's something else. Don't label everything as ICU uh, psychosis and start the patient on quetiapine. So you should rule out uh, other causes that are producing um, this kind of uh, dangerous agitation before just uh, knocking them off. So even when you use haloperidol, you can you can aspirate, you can take five five milligram, and you know you have a rowdy, agitated patient, you give him five milligram, observe, give another five milligram. So you can do that in an acute setting where you have with very dangerous uh, agitation because that can be something. Uh, can be dangerous to the staff and also dangerous for uh, himself. Now, dexmedetomidine, as I said, uh, is very useful for delirium in mechanically ventilated adults, especially where agitation is precluding the weaning and extubation. So it's a conditional uh, recommendation, low quality of evidence, but it can really help. And I can tell you how we use it. So we don't use any benzodiazepines because they're associated with increased incidence of delirium. What we use is opioid infusions. We use uh, morphine and we use um, fentanyl infusions. You can give intermittent boluses. It depends how good your nursing uh, is. Uh, if they're able to you know, titrate and keep the patients, uh, do protocolized sedation well, and you have good number of nurses, then you can have intermittent boluses also being given. In our setting, we don't have enough nurses, so we give continuous infusion, but we do titrate our sedation. So that's very important. And what we do is dexmedetomidine infusion. So dexmedetomidine infusion along with this reduces the opioid requirement. And as we're ready to wean the patient, we shut off the opioid and we keep the patient just on dexmedetomidine. We even extubate these patients on dexmedetomidine. And we see much because you know it doesn't produce respiratory depression and you see much, much less of uh, delirium and agitation in these uh, patients. And they're really calm and quiet. You know, Then when you just give opioid infusion and you shut them off, uh, you can see that they can get uh, you know, quite agitated and may actually make it difficult to wean and you might land up you know, re-sedating the patient and putting them back on uh, you know, higher levels of ventilatory support. So what's very important is, and this is like you have uh, bundles for um, you know, uh, back, you also have a sedation bundle. And what is the sedation bundle? Now this is the A, B, C, D, E, F sedation bundle. And this has 
been proposed by Professor Wes Eli and also published in, uh, by Dr. Morandi. So A stands for you assess, prevent, and you manage pain. This is extremely important. And B, as I mentioned, you give a spontaneous, the ABC trial, if you remember, spontaneous awakening. And so in your patients, you should daily try, if feasible, to give a sedation, uh, you know, spontaneous awakening trial. And, uh, and of course, if you're doing protocol isolation, you don't need to stop the sedation. But if you're in relatively deeper levels of sedation, you need to stop the sedation. And once you stop, you put them on a, once they come out of it, you put them on a pressure support mode. So it give a spontaneous breathing trial. Uh, C is the choice of analgesic sensation, and I've already told you about it. We should avoid benzodiazepines uh, completely, definitely not infusions, avoid midas infusions. Opioid should be the mainstay of your uh, uh, therapy, and you can combine it with dexmedetomidine. Those, uh, in patients who need very lighter levels of sedation, you can use only uh, dexmedetomidine. But if you have a patient who's got ARDS, needs to be deeply sedated, you cannot just use dexmedetomidine because it produces very lighter levels of sedation. So you can combine dexmedetomidine along with your opioids. Now, E stands for early mobility and exercise. This is very, very important. Remember, I told you even passive physiotherapy should be done in a patient who is on a ventilator. Uh, and of course, active mobility and physiotherapy when the patient is uh, more awake. Exercise sparks the brain. It reduces the incidence of delirium and extremely, extremely important besides other benefits of early mobility. From a delirium standpoint, exercise, early exercise and mobility is extremely important. And F is one of the uh, alphabets they added actually to this bundle. It was not there in the original bundle. And F stands for family engagement and empowerment. Now, this is really, really uh, important. And they have had uh, shown studies that if you involve the family, the delirium is much, much less. These patients are already very anxious. Not only can the help family help you in various activities, therapy and other patient related activity, but the patient gets a lot of comfort when the family member is around. Of course, you have to limit it to one member of the family and uh, somebody who will really be proactive with the patient, talk to the patient, motivate the patient. And uh, you have to definitely uh, have good infection control, uh, you know, practices in your intensive care unit and train the family member. Otherwise, you, you don't want more infection rates in these patients because you're getting the family in. But family engagement and empowerment to do various activities with the patient has actually found lesser incidence of delirium in these patients. And this is extremely important. Uh, Tapesh, if you permit, should I just touch on neuromuscular blockage? Uh, you, can, you, can, you can take a break, ma'am, if you want, just, uh, you, just take a breather if you want. Uh, yeah. So guys, if there are any questions, uh, please uh, put up the questions. And uh, I hope you realize the importance of sedation uh, as of now. And you should not be deeply sedating the patients. And uh, benzodiazepines should not be used uh, as infusions because they increase the incidence of delirium. And uh, the delirium that you know we get in the ICU actually results in long-term impairment also. These patients get long-term cognitive impairment. Uh, psychological symptoms and that number. Uh, so sedation has to be used judiciously and uh, benzodiazepines, fentanyl and anticholinergic drugs are the three main drugs. Uh, whether propofol and dexam also cause so much delirium or not at all, ma'am, that probably you can tell. I'm not so sure about that. But uh, anyway, deep sedation should be avoided and benzodiazepines, which I think most of you are not using now, uh, so recognition of delirium is very important and CAM ICU store uh, should be performed in all patients. Uh, uh, most of it is hypoactive, a little bit of it is uh, mixed and uh, whether ma'am melatonin can be used for these drugs, for these patients of delirium, maybe you can tell. So about. There, have been, there have been a lot of studies on melatonin and but they are small studies. We don't have very robust evidence to recommend use of melatonin. But yes, there are studies uh, favoring the use of, and it helps to adjust your sleep, sleep wake cycles. That's how it really helps. And about propofol, what I'd like to say, tell you, you know, prolonged infusions are very, uh, not only is it an expensive drug, it works very well for post-op sedation, post-surgical sedation, you know, so a patient is uh, undergone a major surgery and now needs to be electively ventilated overnight or just for 24 to 48 hours. For these kind of patients, propofol is very good because you can, you know, uh, shut it off and you can, um, you know, it will, it, it's really, but, uh, because of concerns of propofol infusion syndrome, uh, we don't use prolonged uh, uses of uh, these things. So you could either use opioid infusions or you could use uh, propofol uh, infusions. But 
very underutilized drug and i i really urge you to use even when you're using deeper levels of sedation like you know, the rds you can't keep on light sedation right you need to do to facilitate protective lung ventilation you need to use little deeper levels of sedation now along with instead of using a lot of opioids at that time add on serotonin infusion believe me it's it works wonders and i'll tell you from my experience uh, you see a patient you're trying to wean you know his numbers are all good his gas and all is good but this patient is really rowdy and agitated and you know you just because he's rowdy and agitated you again sedate him because you sedate him you go back up on the ventilator setting and this is the vicious cycle and you have to break it and trust me start an infusion of dexmedetomidine along with the opioid in these patients and you will see that this really dramatically resolves you give 24 to 48 hours of dexmedetomidine infusion and you will see that this patient uh, really calms down and it's much much easier to wean and then shut off the opioid and then keep him on dexmedetomidine uh you know as you are extubating in some patients you can even shut it off but it become really it's a really very very useful for weaning in especially in those patients who have uh, gone through very prolonged uh, duration of uh, mechanical ventilation is there any questions uh, tapesh other than touch neuromask is okay and there yeah, yeah ma'am please carry on if you take a breather uh, otherwise i'll speak for some time if you want to take a breather because it is tiring to go on speaking for a long time So friends, please put your questions in the chat box, and uh, we'll be taking them at the end of the session. Okay. And, uh, so I think I'll go on because. Yeah, okay, please, please carry on. And then, uh, so I'll talk about neuromuscular blockade, and then I'll just tell you about various what is the current practices uh, and worldwide. So uh, I know neuromuscular blockade is not really part of this uh, talk. but it's important to know what is the current role of the neuromuscular blair blocking agents especially in ARDS now neuromuscular blocking agents in icu of course you use for uh, patients during tracheal intubation and we know we perform rapid sequence intubation so we use succamethonium or we use rocuronium uh, succamethonium unless contraindicated may be used but lot of conditions in the icu may not may uh, preclude its use Uh, if you're using rocuronium uh, for RSI, remember the dose that you use of rocuronium has to be a little higher, because you know rapid intubation. When we do rapid sequence intubation, the idea is that you want to minimize the time from when the patient is unconscious till when you put the tube in. So you can't have a drug, a muscle relaxant that takes more time uh, to act. So if you want rocuronium to act, can act in 60 seconds, provided you give 1.2 milligram per kg dose. So you have to give a much higher dose than we usually use. if you want to use it for rsi but scolin can be used for many uh, in many settings unless you have patients with hypokalemia or chronic immobilization or some some conditions where it's contraindicated uh, it should be okay to use scolin so we use muscle relaxant for this muscle relaxant may be used sometimes for facilitating various procedures like you're doing some bronchoscopy or you don't want the patient to move at all or you're to facilitate proning or those kind of things but other than that largely the only role of neuromuscular blockade other than short procedures is uh, in patients with ARDS i remember when i was a resident every patient was paralyzed with or without sedation and today when i think of it oh my they were not moving they were getting beautifully ventilated very good uh, patient ventilator symphony but the patient had complete awareness it was the most you know absolute torture of the dream and when i look back at those days i think oh my god we were not sedating those patients we should just we used to just give 10 mg of compost to these patients and that was the end of the story you know and then just give them pap and i i really felt what we did at that time to those patients was was very very cruel uh, without understanding that you cannot give neuromuscular bl blockade to a patient without sedating them i mean this is absolutely inhuman and today we we must give sedation with or without neuromuscular blockade so just uh, telling you you know i'll take it like a story just just briefly about blockade So neuromuscular blocking agents. What is the role in ARDS? And this becomes very relevant because today we have COVID patients, and we are seeing a lot of ARDS, and uh, we have to prone a lot of patients. So what is really the role of neuromuscular blockade? So this is, if you ask me, the landmark paper that was published in NEGM, and this was in 2010, almost 10 years back, and this was uh, neuromuscular blockade in early ARDS and 340 patients. and with AR ARDS and what they did is uh, within 48 hours so they used the satricurium uh, or they used placebo for 48 hours and what was very interesting is that the 90 day mortality was 31.6% uh, in satricurium and 40.7% in the placebo group for the 28 day mortality with the satricurium and 33 day uh, with the placebo group and the rate of icu acquired paresis did not significantly differ uh, between the uh, two groups so this was a captain meyer uh, curve 
and neuromuscular blocking agents for early sepsis. And you can see a benefit with the use of cisatricurium. And this was early in ERDS. And this is the time you're deeply sedating them, you're knocking them off, and you're giving uh, neuromuscular blockade continuous infusions for uh, 48 hours. And what did they find? That in patients with P2F ratio less than 120, 90 day, 90 day mortality was um, you know, significantly better in patients who received cisatricurium. Cisatricurium had significantly more uh, ventilator-free days and more days free of organ failure and other lung uh, failure during uh, the first 28 day, uh, days. Uh, pneumothorax did occur in a larger proportion of patients in the placebo group, 11% uh, versus almost 4% in the cisatricurium group. So the incidence, interestingly, of ICU-acquired paresis did not significantly uh, differ between the two groups. So of course, when you're giving muscle relaxant, and that's one of the reasons why we don't use muscle patients anymore is because we are worried about the uh, you know ICU of white paresis and other conditions like this. So there was really no difference with this short-term 48 hours infusion. And uh, what this study actually uh, you know uh, showed the conclusion was that a 48 hours infusion of cisatricurium for patients with severe ARDS actually reduced the ICU hospital mortality as well as barotrauma without increasing the risk of ICU acquired in uh, you know uh, weakness. And subsequently in patients with uh, ARDS, especially those who are proning, first 48 hours where their P2F ratio is very low, we started using continuous uh, infusions of cisatricurium. A lot of people argued that, is it the strategy or is it the product? Because cisatricurium also has anti-inflammatory uh, action. So is it the cisatricurium that is, uh, you know, helping or is it because of the strategy of paralyzing these patients and ventilating these patients? But subsequently, there have been a lot of trials. Other agents have been used. It's not only cisatricurium, though most of the large studies have used cisatricurium. But the most recent one, and this is published in Intensive Care Medicine, and comes uh, from uh, Professor Walid al Hanzani from uh, you know, Toronto and the guide group. And they have looked at neuromuscular blocking agents in acute respiratory ARDS. And this is an updated systematic review and meta-analysis of the randomized control trial. And very interestingly, they found uh, that if the patient is deeply sedated, okay, so they separated between lighter levels of sedation and deeper levels of sedation. So there was really no difference between, uh, you know, whether you gave the neuromuscular blockade or not. But of course, deeply sedated would be the ones who are, uh, you know, more severe ARDS. And there was a trend toward uh, which favored the neuromuscular blockade. And when they looked at the sub analysis in these conditions, they found that if you look at barotrauma, uh, there was a clear benefit when you used neuromuscular blockade. Uh, ICU acqu uh, acquired weakness, no difference. You can see the diamond is touching the, uh, uh, the vertical line. And in terms of adverse events also, there was no difference between the um, two groups. So based on this, if you see the what are the current recommendations for neuromuscular blockade in patients with uh, ARDS, and this is a rapid practice guideline, and you can see the recommendations. And they have recommended against the use of neuromuscular blockade infusions in adults before first optimizing your mechanical ventilation and assessing the severity of ARDS. So it is not that every patient who's intubated with ARDS, we just knock them off and give them 48 hours of neuromuscular blockade as we saw after the first, that landmark trial. Now in adults with moderate to severe ARDS who tolerate the ventilation using lighter levels of sedation, they have suggested against the use of neuromuscular blockade. Uh, blocking agents, and unless it's required to facilitate your lung protective ventilation, or it is used for, and again, they have suggested uh, neuromuscular blocking agents with judicious deep sedation in that uh, setting. You don't use a neuromuscular blockade on very light levels of sedation, right? So, um, and then in patients with moderate to severe ARDS, in whom the clinician uh, requires uh, more ongoing deep sedation in these patients, Neuromuscular blockade can be used to facilitate lung protective ventilation. And they have suggested neuromuscular infusions up to 48 hours over just giving intermittent bolus of neuromuscular blockade. And um, again, in these, there's low uh, certainty of evidence. Nevertheless, uh, what's really changed is that you don't have a one size fits approach that every patient who's intubated and got ARDS is going to get 48 hours of neuromuscular blockade in the uh, you know, sedation. What you can do is you can individualize it. If this patient is very synchronous, tolerating the ventilation well, and is on lighter levels of sedation, there's really no need to start neuromuscular blockade. Nevertheless, if he has moderate to severe ARDS, he's very hypoxic, uh, giving lung protective ventilation is becoming difficult, then in these patients, you can consider starting neuromuscular blockade. If at all you do, use a infusion rather than 
uh, intermittent bolysis of uh, neuromuscular block. So this is what the uh, meta-analysis of all the randomized control trial and the current evidence for, and this was published uh, last year, uh, for the management of uh, neuromuscular blockade. Now, uh, I'll just tell you about the practices in India and what are the practices uh, worldwide. And this is a very interesting study that uh, we published along with Dr. Rajesh Chawla from Apollo Hospital and myself and other uh, investigators. And this was the first study in India. And we called it the MARS study and looked at the current practices in those days. This is 2014 of mobilization, analgesia, uh, relaxant and sedation uh, in India. So this was a pan-India survey that we did. And this was done through the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. And this was an online survey, which we did over a six month period because we had no idea about what were the sedation, analgesia, neuromuscular blockade practices in uh, India. And very interesting, and this is the practice of 2014. So the compliance with the existing guidelines, the PADS guideline that was there was very, very low. Benzodiazepines were the main predominant sedation in 95% of the patients. Fentanyl was the most commonly used analgesic. And use of neuromuscular blockade was occasional, and uh, only 7% used it only during uh, ventilation. And the commonest used drug was vecuronium and not cisatricurium, and mostly for less than 48 hours for refractory hypoxia. And, um, then what was done is giving analgesia before sedation. It was almost non-existent. So the analgesia first approach was not being practiced. And delirium remains unrecognized. So people said there was less than 10% incidence of delirium in their ICUs. Now, monitoring the sedation levels, analgesia, delirium was extremely low, but this was again in 2014 when we did this, and validated recommendation scales for the same are rarely used. So hardly anybody was using RAS or SAS or CPOT or doing any delirium assessment in the intensive care unit. Now, everyone was aware of the benefits of early mobilization. When we asked them, they said, yes, we know early mobilization is very good for the patient, but the implementation was very low. And when we asked why implementation was low, despite knowing that it was beneficial, it was more basic issues, you know, nursing issues, or uh, because they were worried that the patient would pull out the tubes and uh, lines. So they were very hesitant. But people did understand a large majority that mobilization is very useful for the patient. So this was a very uh, interesting finding. And more recently, 17, uh, along with my international colleagues, we did a worldwide survey looking at assessing uh, pain, sports, both spontaneous breathing. So we looked at the ABCD bundle and we looked at how many people were actually following it worldwide. Uh, so this is the ABCD bundle, which I talked to you about. And we published this in Critical Care Medicine in 2017. And if you look at it, this was a 1,500 respondents and we engaged with uh, 47 countries. And uh, it was interesting because 57 had implemented various degrees of, had compliance with use of uh, sedation. Uh, pain scale was used 83%, sedation in 89%, this is good. 60% uh, were practicing uh, a spontaneous awakening trial, 67% a spontaneous breathing trial, and minimal or no sedation avoidance of benzodiazepine. This was very, very important, was almost 90%. Of course, this is global data, but it includes both developing and developed uh, part of the world. But I can I don't have the data just now for you from India, but I can tell you compared to the 2014 survey, we were doing much, much better in India than we were doing at that time where we were using continuous infusions of benzodiazepine for most of our patients. The delirium monitoring is 70% and 42% use some validated tool. Early mobilization was two thirds of the patients. And there was a significant but an incomplete shift towards uh, patient and family-centered ICU care in accordance with the uh, PADIS guidelines, PAD guidelines, that is a pain agitation delirium guidelines that was then published. So it just showed that, uh, you know, at least by 2017, more and more people are aware of the ABCDF guideline. If you just implement this in your ICU, it is good enough and you can really improve outcomes in patients with, uh, with sedation. But definitely we have a long way to go and we have a lot of uh, other factors to look into. And uh, I'd like to leave you with this ABCDF sedation bundle. So awakening and breathing quote. And then I'll just reiterate it because I find this very, very interesting. If you remember the crux of my talk. Uh, so you need uh, to have a paired approach. You know, that is awakening and breathing coordination. So the paired approach of intra and uh, you know, allowing, putting the patient on pressure support ventilation. 
Uh, of course, if you have protocol of sedation and your patient is always maintained at a RAS of zero, you don't need to shut off the sedation because that could actually be dangerous. You know, patient will start extubating himself. But if you are on little deeper levels of sedation, it's a good practice to every morning uh, shut off the sedation. And it's very important, don't just go and shut off the sedation. Make sure the nurse is aware of it and there's someone around the uh, patient. Now, the choice of sedation is very important and use dexmedetromidine. Use a lot of dexmedetromidine. It's really, really important, useful tool in your armamentarium. Avoid benzodiazepine infusions. Use opioids. Use dex along with opioids where you need only lighter levels of sedation. Use dexmedetromidine alone. Delirium monitoring is very, very important. Uh, I've used both these scores, the ICDSC, but CAM ICU is really simple to follow. Believe me, once you train your nurses, it's really important. Three times a day, they need to check whether the patient has delirium or not. Just a yes or a no or cannot assess. If a patient is very deeply sedated or is comatose, of course, you cannot assess. Um, but in all our patients who in whom we can assess uh, delirium, we do this assessment three times a day. And we're very conscious about what our, our delirium I'm very happy to tell you that we started with almost 60 to 70 percent uh, delirium in our ventilated patients and now we've come down to about 20 percent one of my dm fellows has recently done a study and we've really reduced the incidence of delirium and that's only because we are able to objectively measure it because otherwise we have no idea whether our delirium is going up or going down in these patients early mobility many benefits but definitely delirium is also one of them and exercise exercise sparks the brain even if the patient is not mobile do pack Physiotherapy for this patient. If you don't have physiotherapists and occupational therapists coming around the clock, you can engage the family member to do this. Tell him, you know, five times a day you need to do this exercise, move his limbs, do this for the patient. And most important is the family communication and involvement. This really, really reduces the incidence of delirium. Sometimes you have a family member coming in, you may not even know that this guy wears glasses. You know, the family member says, Oh, can we give him his glasses or can we give him a paper to read? You know, they can really, really help you. And we should not just look at them as Oh, disturbance in the ICU and just shoot them off saying that, oh, infection ho jayega. You know, as long as you train them properly uh, to, you know, uh, follow uh, in basic infection control uh, practices, hand hygiene, etc. They can be a real asset, uh, not only to help with patient related um, activities, if you empower them, uh, they can, you know, interact with the patient, make them feel comfortable and definitely reduce the incidence of delirium in these uh, patients. So this becomes uh, really important. Now, in addition to the A, B, C, D, E, bundle f bundle which is the most important in my talk i'd like to say that remember delirium is associated with significantly increased morbidity and mortality rates you cannot talk about sedation today without talking about delirium so your delirium is a new buzzword you should you should focus on delirium in your intensive care unit and it is invisible unless you look for it i urge you all to perform the cam icu score in your icu do it once a day do it occasionally if you want to start with that train your nurses they're really really good at doing this you know so, and it's, it's simple to do at the bedside. If you remember the video, I'm happy to share this if anyone wants to uh, have this demonstration. So unless you look for it, it's invisible. So important to score. And remember first, assess the sedation levels using the SAS or the RAS scale, and then look for the presence of uh, delirium. Okay, you can't just look at delirium. You have to know what is the level of sedation in these uh, patients and use non-pharmacological -pharmacologi non approach. You can't just say, oh, delirium is very high. So just, you know, knock them off, give quitabine, give, uh, you know, haloperidol. You need to, if you see a lot of these patients who are agitated, you need to think about uh, what are you doing to reduce, you know, intensity. And it's not just a pharmacological. You need to adopt various non-pharmacological uh, strategies in your intensive care. You know, you know we can, you can even, uh, sometimes it's difficult to, control the light and control the noise. So we give your plugs, you know, to our patients like you have on the aircraft, or you can give that to the patients. You can even give them those, um, uh, what are they called? The eye, uh, you know, the kind of shields that you can put, just so simple so that, you know, even if the light is on or the dim light, some patients just can't sleep. So these are simple interventions you can take to facilitate, uh, you know, sleep uh, in the ICU. And facilitating sleep is not giving a sedative, okay? Because that doesn't give you the real, the true sleep, okay? He's just knocked off for you, but he's not having sleep. So that's extremely important that we have to facilitate sleep, good sleep in the uh, ICU. And remember, use a neuromuscular blockade is discouraged. We shouldn't use it uh, in all patients with ARDS, except when it is required to facilitate lung protective ventilation and use it with deep sedation with as an infusion. If at all you use it, use it as an infusion for uh, 48 hours. And then later, of course, you need to uh, reassess that. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to take questions. Shall I uh, stop sharing, Tapesh? Yes, yes. Th thank you, ma'am. Please stop.
Uh, so thank you very much, ma'am. That was a very informative and a very elaborate lecture, and uh, that must have been tiring also. So um, there are some uh, questions. Let's, uh, put up the questions. Uh, can Dexmed cause a withdrawal reaction? Um, can Dexmed oh, cause withdrawal uh, reaction? Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, question. No, it doesn't produce uh, the withdrawal, not known to produce. So that way, any of the sedatives good, but no, it doesn't. And we just shut it off when we have to. We don't pay for it or titrate it or anything like that. It's, it's, it's a drug. If you're not using it, I urge you to use it. It's a really good drug. Uh, I'm very proud to say that um, dexmedetomidine was made available in India uh, by me. Uh, the first ampule of dexmedetomidine I've used because I was using this drug in the United States and I, I really liked it so much. And I was like, why don't we have dexmedetomidine? And it was available as Presidex. And it was really, really expensive. And uh, then we worked with one of the local companies and we said, can we, man can we have a generic in India? Because this is a very expensive drug, but I found this to be an excellent uh, drug. And following this, uh, we had Themis Medicare who could manufacture it as for a very, very low cost. And I tell you, we're very fortunate because in Europe, in North America, they use dexmedetomidine very less because it's a very expensive drug. And today we have so many generics and it's so cheap in India that this is a very useful drug and it's available widely and it's of a low cost. So we are very fortunate to have it. If you ask me one more drug that I would really like to have available is remifentanil. But unfortunately, for some reason, we don't have remifentanil in India. Remifentanil is an excellent drug to use in the ICU because it has a very short uh, context sensitive half-life only four minutes. So, you know, you shut it off and you have your patient, uh, you know, it's really, really an excellent drug. But unfortunately, we don't have that. But we do have DEX. So we should use uh, more and more of DEX metadromidine because I would say we're very fortunate. So we did the first randomized controlled trial uh, in the country, following which DEX metadromidine, the DCIGI made DEX metadromidine available uh, in India. This was in 2008. And now, you know, DEX metadromidine is widely used, not only in the critical care, but also in uh, the operating room. And at that time, dexmedetomidine was only approved for up to 24 hour sedation. But now uh, the trials have shown that you can even use it for prolonged sedation. So it's excellent news for the ICU people because we can use this drug uh, as an adjunct with the opioids. It reduces your opioid requirement by 50%, uh, produces uh, mild, weak analgesia. It's not a strong, uh, potent analgesic. So if analgesia is paramount, it's a post-surgical patient, you need a good amount of opioid or epidural analgesia, then dexmedetomidine can only be an adjunct. It cannot be uh, the sole uh, analgesic. So you really need to titrate what you're using depending upon the needs and situation uh, in the intensive care unit. Ma'am, ma what about the incidence of bradycardia? You start getting some time on uh, dexamine infusion. Then you have to decrease the dose, I guess, or uh, what should be done? Because there is a lot of bradycardia. Very, uh, very, very good question. You know, I'll tell you. First ampule of dexmedetomidine I gave, and they have been uh, coming from an anesthesia background. You know, I'm in the habit of pushing drugs. So what I did is, you know, the first dex I just pushed it, and the patient had profound bradycardia, and I was so scared. I said, "My God, I have not even started the trial. Just one test, and the patient had heart rate between 23." But this settled and also responded to atropine. So what I want to tell you is, do not give a bolus dose. Okay, you can just start with the infusion, 0.2 to 0.7 is the dose. And you just start with the infusion. You don't have to give any bolus. And if at all you give, it has to be given over 10 to 15 minutes. Like, a, you know, kind of when you just use it for a procedure like a bronchoscopy or fiber optic or something like an awake patient, we give about one uh, microgram per kg. And we give it, so you have 50 microgram and we give it over 15 minutes. Always give it as an infusion. Never give a bolus dose. It goes as an infusion. That, that, that's absolutely that's absolutely right, ma'am, because this bolus is mentioned in the literature everywhere. And when we had given the bolus, the guy developed hypotension and bradycardia. So, yeah, but it's yeah. still mentioned in literature. We do, uh, you know, all the sedatives produce hypotension. Uh, if you get, if you have a patient who's already with a very low heart rate, that is the patient in whom I feel that, you know, patient's baseline heart rate is only 50s. May. So, I, I'm a little wary about giving dexmedetomidine in these patients. But otherwise, by and large, it and it's beautiful because, you know, tachycardia in any form is bad in the ICU. Tachycardia is bad. And when you start dexmed infusion, you have these patients with 130 heart rate, 140 heart rate, whatever you, you start dexmedetomidine and you have a very nice, uh, you know, the heart rate and everything settles very beautifully. So this is uh, one of the things, you know, I, I see a lot of people using evabredin 
uh, especially those who come from a cardiology background, like any cardiologist, you call the first drug, he starts his evoplatin. Uh, not really a good drug for the intensive care unit, but dexmedetomidine really works wonders. And I would really urge you to try, use this drug in the ICU. Ma'am, then they ask, uh, what is the maximum time for which dexam can be used? I think you've already answered that there is no upper limit of in, uh, infusion dose. No maximum. In one of the European studies, they have used it for 27 days in a patient. So there's no maximum time. Earlier, it was approved by US FDA But now we have got DCGI to approve uh, it. Now, the interesting thing about DCGI, you know, uh, they don't care what people do abroad. For every indication that you're using a drug for, you have to have a separate approval, you have to have a study, and you have to have permission. So anything else uh, is uh, considered as an off label indication. For example, people are using intrathecal or epidural dexmedetomidine. This is not approved in India. So when you say off-label use, what happens is that you can use it because internationally there are studies and there are a lot of people using these drugs. But if something goes wrong, then the company will just put their hands up. They'll say this is an off-label indication. You know, this is not recommended on our system for use. So that's the only thing. But in the intensive care unit, we're very fortunate because today it is recommended for procedural sedation. It's recommended for ICU sedation and also for long-term sedation. There's no cap on the number of days. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is, ma'am, in hypotensive patients, which is the sedative of choice? Yeah, no, this is this is very uh, tricky because, you know, a uh, lot of people, you know, if there's hypotension, they just stop all. Now, that's not the right approach. You need to treat the hypotension, okay? Whether it's with volume or whether it is with uh, um, vasoactive drugs. You need to treat the hypertension, but you can't, you can't shut off the sedation because you're giving sedation for a different purpose, right? You're giving sedation to facilitate ventilation or you're giving it to calm down the patient or you're giving it, uh, you know, to decrease the awareness and anxiety in the patient. So you can't just shut that off because there's hypertension. You need to treat the hypertension, volume or vasoactive drugs along with uh, sedation. Of course, you can come down on the uh, amount of sedation you're giving. And sometimes these patients who are hypertensive and all may not need as much as uh, sedation as... Uh, uh, required as you're giving so you can come down on it but uh, stopping the sedation and all is not an option thank you ma'am the next question if you have to choose between propofol and dexmed which is better wherein airway is uh, already uh, <coughs> uh, airway is uh, one minute intubated patient uh, if you have to choose between propofol and dexmed which is better when airway is already secured yeah, so I say it depends on the indication. You could use either. So propofol, again, is for short-term sedation. Remember that. If I'm going to have a patient with ARDS, I'm going to ventilate for five, almost a week, then don't use propofol. Post-surgical patient works very well, or someone who's coming even with a medical condition but will settle, you know, in two, three days, then you can use propofol. Remember, propofol does not produce any analgesia, okay? But it can give you deeper levels of sedation, whereas dexmedetomidine gives you lighter levels of sedation, and it gives you some amount of analgesia. So it really depends on what is the requirement of that uh, patient. So both are acceptable, both are good. From a delirium standpoint, uh, propofol does produce, but much less. But dexmedetomidine is really the best from, uh, you know, from a delirium standpoint, definitely. Ma'am, uh, ma kindly elaborate on substance abuse and delirium. Tips for alcohol and smoking dependent person. Uh, this is really, really challenging. And I will... I, think, <laughs> I think this is not the purview of the lecture. <laughs> It's an important point, I can tell you, because I'm an expert on substance abuse. But this history is very important, huh? very, very important to elicit. And you have a lot of people who are taking a lot of, uh, you know, kind of agents, not just smoking and drinking. And it's very important because you try sedating these patients, you give them analgesia, and you see nothing is working. And often you go back and see they are either, uh, you know, tobacco addicts, or they're on cigarettes, or, or they're taking some ganja, or something like that. They are something. And or they might be even a chronic cancer pain patients, okay? Because I work at Tata Memorial. Uh, so these patients, you know, you're just giving them some fentanyl infusion. They're so tachycardic. Their pain is not settled at all. And this is because they are baseline on some fentanyl patches. They're taking morphine tablets. And here you're giving them some piddly stuff. So that history is very important, you know? This history is extremely important. And a lot of time it could be withdrawal. So you need to uh, as, uh, address the withdrawal rather than just knock them off, you know? Especially in alcoholics. I'd like to add to that, actually, <clears throat> alcohol withdrawal syndrome is a very common entity. 
and uh, you won't get any history. You know, patient sometimes they, it's not even recorded that is an alcoholic. Family. Therefore, Family. he will start either getting hyperactive delirium with fever, tachycardia, and sometimes it happens on the vent. If the patient is intubated, and after day three, day four, suddenly the, he'll start getting fever, tachycardia, some sweating, and you'll be wondering what he has. So alcohol withdrawal is very much there in the ICU, and you should recognize it. And it comes very surreptitiously because uh, you don't realize it. And they get fever. Exactly. fever. A very important point you're saying. When you're sedating the patient and you're seeing they're requiring higher levels or they're suddenly getting agitated and rowdy and this is not working well, suspect one of these substance abuses. And family can give you the history. Even if the patient won't tell you, uh, family can often tell you that if he's uh, consuming alcohol or if he's an alcoholic. Yeah. Or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, and ma'am, also nicotine withdrawal is also very important, especially among this UPD. After two, three days, they will suddenly have withdrawal. There will be bradycardia, restlessness. And if they can communicate, they will generally say they want a cigarette or a BD. And then you've got to put a patch. And if they're on the tube or on the ventilator, then again, there's a problem. So both these things, are, that's a good question, actually. But uh, for good. The, No, yeah. because this can be something that can impede your uh, management of sedation. And you have to keep this in mind. You cannot just... Uh, you know, wash it off and then give just keep on sedating and giving analgesia because this will influence the drugs that you're using and the quantity and the, you know, how you're managing the patient. Okay, Ma'am, the next question, use of Dexmed in COVID patients who are on NIV, is it better or not? Uh, kindly please guide on this. Oh, very good question. I just love this. Okay, so uh, now um, NIV is one of my favorite topics, by the way. So the concerns with NIV, firstly, between NIV and HFNO, you should use HFNO. There's good evidence to use HIFTO, but of course, with the oxygen shortage and all, we, many people have switched to use uh, NIV. It works better with a mixed uh, kind of respiratory failure. And also when there's increased work of breathing, you could use it in some patients. Peep delivery, of course, is better. Now the danger in COVID is what we're seeing, uh, which all of you are very familiar with is the P silly that we're talking about. So in this kind of conditions, you're seeing uh, patient in inflicted, self-inflicted lung injury. And you'll see patients with uh, 9 to 10 ml of tidal volume. And this could be deliberate. These are the patients I often consider intubating early, though their numbers may be all uh, fine. Now, in these patients, okay, uh, especially those with a higher respiratory rate, I'm more concerned when not only when the tidal volume is high, but when the respiratory rate is also high. Okay. So in these patients, it is worth giving them sedation. And what you want is conscious sedation. But even your sedation could be dangerous. So you don't want a patient to be knocked off. And, uh, you know, close monitoring may not be possible. So dex meditomidine is an excellent drug. And we use a lot of dex in these patients. And uh, like we're saying, if you have these high tidal volume, you need to intubate them. But in some patients, in a few patients, I've actually been able to avoid these intubations by them, you know, sedating them like this. Because it helps, you know, kind of calm them, you know, reduce the tidal volume and the respiratory rate. So this can help. So DEX will be a good drug to use in this setting. In fact, ma'am, I'll just like to add to that. You know, sometimes when you're intubating the patient that is on TPs, he gets restless. A lot of times people say that you know, he's biting the tube, fighting the tube. So there, I think, rather than extubating the patient and not uh, making him calm, DEXM is again a very good drug. You can just calm him on DEXM and reassess whether he's fit for extubation. Yeah. But here I'd like to add, you know, don't do it at the time you put him on TPs. Start earlier. We start earlier when they're on deeper levels. Believe me, it works really well. You start weaning off your morphine or your fentanyl and you start upping your dex. And, you know, so your patient is already on a 24 hours of dex infusion. And then you very, you know, he transitions in a very calm way to uh, this. You know, we see very less of agitation. This wor drug works wonders with agitation, you know. Uh, you actually see patients coming down. A lot of the time, you know, my DM students tell me, oh, he's, you know, he was so rowdy and he was just not able to wean him. So we have sedated him, knocked him off, and now we put him back on assist control. I said, don't do that. We start dexmetron. So often you can facilitate weaning with this drug. So I would say don't do it when you put a patient on TPs. But do it a little earlier. You know, use it as an adjunct with your sedative and then put off your sedative, uh, your opioid or whatever you're giving, and then uh, continue your dexmetron. We extubate patients on dexmetron infusion and they're really calm they're you know talking to you calm and not agitated so that's the level you want them to be at thank you for the answer ma'am next question how long can we use propofol and uh, with low dose less than four milligram per kg or what is that even dosing and duration of uh, propofol yeah so uh, it is like uh, 48 to 72 hours nothing very rigid about it because we're concerned about this propofol syndrome the entity that you're all aware of so I would say not more than 72 hours. We should be wary about this. 
and it's also expensive you know you can't just keep on using uh, propofol but definitely it is a drug that you can titrate very easily so excellent in post surgical patients you know who you want to extubate the next morning who you are electively just mentally taking because they were hypothermic or because of some other reason so it works really well in these kind of but not something to consider for long term uh, uh, but definitely in terms of delirium propofol and benzodiaz uh, dexmedetomidine are the best agents and recommended by the paris guidelines unless contraindicated ma'am just i think you have the questions are just coming in and coming in ma'am choice of sedation in septic shock ma'am Yeah, so I don't think the choice of sedation would be different in septic shock or other, uh, you know, condition. Uh, it's just that patients in shock obviously would have hypotension. Like I mentioned, you need to treat the hypotension. Sedatives are not uh, treatment for hypertension, and neither should be they stop during hypotension. So you need to continue. You could reduce the doses, but you shouldn't stop the sedation because the patient BP is low. Ma'am, the next one: intermittent sedation or continuous sedation with sedation break, which is better? So uh, both are good. Uh, it depends on your intermittent would be better because you're like the drug well. The real problem is with the prolonged metabolism, you know, delayed metabolism of these drugs when you give it as an infusion. So it depends on what is the nursing uh, level in your hospital, you know, your setup. If you have one is to one nursing, intermittent is very good uh, because but then she should be able to, uh, you know. Titrate. I mean, uh, look, do a sedation score every hour, and then decide on whether bolus is required or not. So, if you have that level of nursing, and also one is to one nursing, intermittent is the best. But if you don't have that, then it is safer to have continuous infusion. You can't have a nurse giving one bolus and then not assessing the patient for next four hours, and then coming back and arbitrarily giving another bolus. You know that that kind of practice doesn't work. So, uh, it's, it really depends upon the logistics and the infrastructure. Uh, Ma'am, then if we are talking about lighter level of sedation, what is the RAS we are targeting? So the RAS level, as I mentioned, uh, could be uh, zero, minus one, up to minus minus one sometimes zero or minus two. Up to minus two is okay. Yeah. So it uh, depends on what is the condition of the patient. You know, you would like to keep them at zero, where they're calm and communicative. But all patients who are particularly ill cannot be kept at zero. So minus one, minus two is acceptable. What is very important, you know, even if you don't have good nursing, uh, you know, nurses like one nurse is looking after two patients, something like that. If you see the RAS is minus four, minus five, at least then go and shut off your sedation. What is happening in most ICUs in India is the RAS score is minus four, minus five. That means even on shaking the patient, he's not responding. He's at such a deep level of sedation. Despite that, the sedation infusion is on. Okay, so at least if they're minus four, minus five. Uh, if you tell the nurses if they're that deep, just shut off sedation. That is good enough, you know, because at least you will facilitate. And remember, the interruption is to facilitate the metabolism of the drug. It is not to assess the neurological status, as most people say in exams. I shut off the sedation. I do daily uh, interruption of sedation to assess the neurological status. It is not for that. Uh, thank you for the answer, ma'am. The next question: choice of paralytics in neuromuscular disease. So then again, do you really need neuromuscular blockade? That's the question. You can use any of the uh, agents. Nothing, no contraindication for any specific agent. But uh, I would avoid using it as far as possible. My one indication to use it, as I told you, is only for tracheal intubation and in patients with uh, ARDS, and that too early in the disease. The next question, ma'am, can you tell a little about the petal trial? Sorry. Can you tell a little about the petal trial, PTL, petal trial? Petal trial. See, I don't know the details and the numbers uh, involved. I cannot say that. Sorry. Even I am not aware of the details of the petal trial. I will be able to tell you. Yeah. Uh, do we need bolus dose before starting? Uh, bolus dose of? I am just coming. Uh, Um, how to assess uh, PCLA? Yeah, so that you can assess. Uh, of course, it's uh, at the bedside when you have a patient. So remember, if you're giving uh, hypomesic annular oxygen, this is very physiological, okay? So you don't get that phenomena that you see on patients on NIV uh, who are on pressure support or PEEP. So you, you look at the tidal volume, and if you see the tidal volume is very high, and you know you have seen 
I don't know how many of you have experienced, but we've seen cases of pneumoidus tinnum and even pneumothoraces in patients who are spontaneously breathing, not patients who are intubated, that of course is known. But this is all uh, due to the self-inflicted lung injury. So this is a phenomena that has been seen in uh, COVID patients uh, that you're seeing this high drive and at the same time, they're maintaining the oxygenation, they're maintaining the saturation and uh, yet they have this. And this could cause, as you know, you're giving lung protective ventilation in patients who you're intubating. And on the other side, you have patients spontaneously breathing with such high tidal volume. So you have to be careful about this. So just at the bedside, look at your uh, ventilator settings, look at your respiratory rate, look at your expired tidal volume and tell you, uh, at least give you some, uh, not very objective, but subjective assessment that this patient is having a self-induced uh, lung injury. And definitely when you see things like subcut emphysema, you see pneumomitis tandem, you see these kind of conditions, you know that this is related to the PCLA. Um, then another question, does Dexmed help as sedation in neuro patients where we want to assess neuro status very frequently? Uh, yes, you could use it. It's not used a lot in the neuro ICU, but uh, it gives you lighter levels of sedation. Now, these kind of patients, you know, again, it depends upon what is the neurological status of the patient, right? So the sedation is only one part of it. So um, it really depends. So, you know, if you want to frequently assess and neuro patients often do in that sense exmedetomidine works really well yes i think ma'am that is uh, just just one minute ma'am let me see if we left anything i think update on bradycardia observed with dexmed ma'am has already talked about so don't give a bolus that's what i have said don't give a bolus any role of nicotine patch, we already told you. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody's question has been answered because a long chat box. <laughs> Thank you. Must have been tough. Yeah. I, I, I think that's about it. Anybody, I hope everybody's question is answered. Please put it up if any, anybody's question is not answered. Or uh, should we come to an end then? Uh, I think that was an... Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. I think uh, that, that we haven't had so many questions ever and so much audience. This was, I think, our best session and had to be. Thank you so much. And for speaking for so long, you must, must be tired also. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Very passionate about teaching. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for a patient hearing. I should thank you at the time in COVID uh, era and uh, to attend. And, uh, thank you very much. Take care and stay safe. Yeah. Take care, ma'am. Thank you. Hello. 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 Uh, good